Welcome to Casual Friday. Hi, I'm Roxanne Richardson, and this is my weekly Casual Friday podcast. In this week's podcast, I continue my tour through Weldon's Practical Needlework. This week, I'll show you volume nine, which was published in 1894. After that, I'll show you the project I recently finished as part of Finish It February. This is a project that I put to the side for several months after discovering several significant problems in the knitting. Today, I'll walk through the process of doing a major fix on a project that was nearly finished. In December 2022, I purchased a 12 volume set of Weldon's Practical Needlework. These are facsimile copies of the first 12 years Weldon's published its popular series starting in 1886. These facsimile copies were published by Piecework Magazine in the early 2000s. Each volume represents one full year of monthly issues with each issue devoted to a particular needle craft like knitting, crocheting, edgings, patchwork, macrame, tatting, embroidery, etc. Each week, I've been giving you a tour of one of the volumes. Piecework no longer sells these hard copy facsimile copies, but they do sell digital copies of the knitting and crocheting issues on their website. Let's go to the overhead and explore what volume nine has for us. The issues in this volume were originally published in 1894. Quickly, I wanna show you what they've got in the index. So this reflects the 12 issues from this particular year, which is 1894. So they've got three issues that were devoted to crochet. They've got a new topic that they are introducing, which is plain needlework. So it's basic hand sewing um, skills. And this is interesting to me because when I was first looking at knitting manuals, I was wanting to know how they were telling knitters to sew their seams, how they were telling them to put things together. And they never explained it, or very rarely. My understanding was they were probably just seaming the way they were taught with woven fabrics. That was certainly what I thought to do when I was first learning to knit in the 80s. If it told, if a pattern just said to seam something, I would use back stitch or whip stitch. Those, that was what I knew how to do. So this is the kind of thing that's interesting to me to look at. So now we've got an issue devoted to stocking knitting, which we haven't seen since the very early Weldon's issues. You'll see socks and stockings in practical knitter, but you won't see an issue of practical stocking knitter. Um, we've got another uh, series of Mont Malik embroidery. We've been seeing um, quite a bit of embroidery in the, in the previous few years, but specifically Mont Malik is very popular. Uh, and then we've got crinkled and crepe tissue paperwork, and this is the fourth series. So there was a series of this in the past a week and past couple of weeks and somebody asked in the comments what is crinkled paperwork so from every time they have the first series of something they kind of describe what it is and and the basic techniques that are used for it and in the first series of this they explained that uh, you no longer have to crinkle up tissue paper yourself before working with it in order to make things out of it um, that you can get pre-crinkled paper. And it's saying crepe tissue paper. So I'm imagining that this is like the, when you get paper streamers, like for birthday parties that you're hanging up, that kind of paper that's pre-crinkled or crepe paper um, that I imagine that that is what they are working with. And then here we've got um, two issues of knitting and then they've got a first series of monograms and initials. So I just quickly wanted to show you some of the, the practical plain needlework that's in here. So they've got all the basic stitches like running stitch and hem stitch and how to do hems and seams and all of that kind of thing all through here, show you how to space things out, how to do tucks, how to measure and, and diagram all of that stuff out. When I was flipping through here and I saw here a button stitch loop made at the end of a band. So it's a way to use what's called buttonhole stitch, but you're, you're creating it, instead of creating it into, sewing it into fabric, you're creating a little loop on the edge. And this was a technique that I used in my first 
sweater that I did for my long-term project to knit a sweater from each decade. The first sweater was one from 1904 and they gave no information in the pattern about where and how to place buttons or what to do. They just say, sew the button in buttonholes and like where. So for the neck, I decided to do one of those kinds of loops. Um, and I just used uh, embroidery floss, floss, I believe. So I did that in the edge here. And I used a YouTube video uh, to look it up because I didn't, I didn't know how to do it. Um, but th that's what they're showing in here is that process right there. So here's another thing that a knitter might want to use, the attaching piece of lace on the edging of woven fabric. So here, this is how to knit socks and stockings for boys and girls. What's interesting about this particular set of sock and stocking instructions is that with the exception of this one, which is for a baby, um, who is not going to be walking around and is not going to be wearing these for very long. Uh, the, this particular stocking is knit in the round, like most stockings of the era were, but they're not always, but most of them, especially for adults, are going to be knit in the round. The rest of the socks and stockings here are knit flat. So the leg is knit in one piece with the seam going up the back. And when you get to the ankle, the instep stitches are put on hold while you work the heel, which is like you would work any sock in the round. Um, but then you're working each half of the heel separately. And this type of heel, the majority of these heels, again, not all of them, are very much the, the type of heel that is in the sock pattern that I released earlier in January, the free sock pattern, where it's got a shaped common heel where you're knitting it in stockinette. You have some decreases to shape the back. And then you just, the heel is just the two halves of the heel are just um, joined together. So here they're sewn together because you just cast off each half of the heel and you're gonna sew those together and you're gonna sew up the back. And then for the foot, you're working the instep stitches that were on hold. You work the instep all the way to the, the toe and shape it. And then you pick, and then for the sole, you pick up stitches along each side of the heel flap and you knit the sole separately. And so the advantage of this kind of a construction when you are knitting, hand knitting your kids' socks is that you can re-knit the sole. You just you just take the, the join out of the toe and you can rip back the foot and re-knit the sole uh, because that's the part that's gonna wear out with a kid. And then also, if their feet grow, you can replace the sole, knit it longer, and then just add length also to um, the instep. So that's you know a practical way of dealing with kids who are you know running through their, the soles of their socks and also growing that you don't have to re-knit the entire thing every time. You don't have to re-knit the entire foot. You can just knit the sole and you can extend the length as needed. All of the rest of these socks in here are all knit on two needles and, and pretty much for that reason. So you do get some sort of fancier stuff coming in here as well. There's some interesting stitch patterns that you're going to see for um, these different socks. And here you start seeing that's just the variety of things like a shoulder cape. Uh, and then they've got these little under vests and, and jackets for little kids. It's pretty the, Now we've got gentlemen's stockings, but these are, uh, these are gonna be knit in the round. They're gonna have a regular turned heel, not that shaped common heel. A little petticoat, quilt squares, uh, combination uh, garment underwear. This is a baby's Kamshatka jacket. There was a Kamshatka jacket a few issues ago and I was, I remember saying out loud, I don't know what that means. And a number of people mentioned in the comments, oh, it's a region of Russia. It's probably very cold and, and it would make sense that that type of thing would get that label. So maybe this is an indication of just how warm that is supposed to be. Child's wide ribbed vest, which is an undergarment, um, stays for a child of three. Fisherman's helmet. So in the past few issues, they've been having patterns that were meant to be charity knitting for uh, fishermen. 
and then you've got a child's first sock you've got some beaded knitting and then there's just a little stitch pattern that could be used in some in something so this issue has got a bunch of things and it also introduces something new that we haven't seen before and that is a representation of something being worn by a person it's not a photograph it's an engraving um, but typically in the past you would have seen a garment just laid flat and not on a person and so this is the first time and this is an interesting uh, jacket to see it's a brioche jacket it's got those phenomenally puffy sleeves um, that are from the 1890s late 1890s highly shaped of course it's an exaggerated shape because it's on a drawing and we've got you know more little babies bonnets and booties and more uh, ripped stockings and again here we see something that's being modeled this is underwear being modeled so we've got some um, a border we've got another child's hood got some gloves and again Here's a hat. They're showing it on somebody's head so you can see how it's supposed to be worn. More stockings, stitch patterns, and um, a little stitch pattern with a, a border. So that's it for this year of Weldon's Practical Needlework. So when I was first doing Finish It February, I was really just working on unfinished projects because I had tons of them. Um, but because I would do this every single year, gradually uh, the pile diminished and I was able to kind of keep myself reminded of what I put to the side um, during the middle of the year if I started a project and didn't finish it. So as a result, I really don't have many UFOs when it comes, when February comes around. Uh, so one of the things I do is fix things or repair things, modify things. Um, last year, I changed the neck of this sweater, I, which I knit between 2005 and 2007. I always felt the neck was too wide and too narrow. And I, if I could knit it deeper, that would help to fill it in. But I couldn't uh, find any of the leftover yarn in my stash. And then last year... Uh, as I was clearing out a closet downstairs, I found a bag of leftover yarns that I had intended to donate to someone who does charity knitting and never had. And I saw a leftover ball. And so I was able to uh, fix uh, the neck of the sweater using the original yarn. So that's kind of some things I do. I added a belt to a sweater that I really liked that was like a, a big kind of coat sweater that didn't have any fastenings. And I, ha I found some leftover yarn uh, and I was able to knit myself a belt with it, and which m really improves it. So sometimes I'm improving existing things that I've been using. Sometimes I'm fixing something that gets holes, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, this year, it was uh, the one thing that I really needed to finish uh, and problem solve was a hat that I'd started in the fall. Here's the finished hat. It's a, a replica of a shaker hat that was knit in the late 19th century, I believe. Maybe it was the early 20th century. But it's in the collection of the Shaker Museum. And so they run a knit along uh, every fall where they reverse engineer one of the items in their collection. And you learn about that item, like who the original people were. It was these two sisters. And they were knitting this hat and they also did mittens. They used a combination of raccoon fur and silk. They blended it together and they hand spun the yarn. Eventually they found a mill that could card the fiber, you know, do the preparation so that then they, then they could spin it. And then they eventually found a mill that could actually do the whole process of creating the yarn itself. So then all they had to do <laughs> was uh, knit it. To me, this was just a really uh, interesting looking, uh, crazy looking hat. It was an unusual looking hat. And I love knitting things from these previous eras because Oftentimes there are just really interesting construction methods and technique combinations. And I'm always looking to learn something new with every project. So I really wanted the experience of knitting through this hat and, and learning some specific things. Um, but I always end up learning things I don't expect. And, and some of that comes from 
making an assumption about something and what the purpose of it is. So when I originally saw the picture of this hat, I assumed that this brim was like a sun brim. And so I'm not an expert crocheter. And so when I was doing the crochet and I could see that it wasn't sticking out, I felt I was doing something wrong. And then I tried it on my head and I went, oh, I see what the brim is for. The brim is to come across the forehead to keep it warm. And because the ribbing can come, can ride further back on the forehead, that means that the base of the ribbing can really come down low at the back of the neck. So this is a problem that my husband had talked to me about a few years ago when he was riding his bike to work um, in Minnesota uh, in the winters. And he would say that when he would have his hat down his forehead, then it would come up in the back of his neck. And if he pulled it uh, down to cover up his neck, then it was, wasn't high enough. Uh, it was too high on his forehead. And so I had come up with a way of using short rows to extend the length on one half of the ribbing. So you could either decide to have the ex extended part across the front or you could choose to have it across the back. But I just didn't recognize that that was what was going on when I when it was a, a crocheted brim. And so it wasn't until I tried it on that I realized that was uh, what was happening. And uh, this button thing was really interesting too. And I think that the button is just here to keep this the top layer of ribbing in place so that it doesn't slide way back because this opening is so large that if something wasn't keeping it in place, it would come back and then you wouldn't have the double layer that you wanted at the top of your forehead. Uh, so uh, the pattern was written based on re reverse engineering the original hat. And so there were a few mistakes in the pattern, most of which I caught. Uh, there was one that I didn't caught and that one caused kind of a, a what I considered to be a big mistake. And that was that the instructions for creating this opening were to, you know, start at the beginning of the round a knit a certain, and they said knit, not do ribbing, knit a certain number of stitches and then bind off 50 and then knit to the end of the round. I just didn't process the word knit uh, and I just continued in ribbing and then I, I did the opening. Uh, the problem was I should have done knitting because then that creates this nice pearl edge, uh, a turning round, and it creates this pearl edge, which makes picking up stitches for the ear flaps easier. The opening, because the opening wasn't, wasn't centered correctly with the opening for the buttonhole, um, and the ear flap instructions were, I think the instructions uh, created an ear flap that were shorter than what the, the schematic indicated. And so I needed to rip out the ear flaps and they had been so difficult to pick up because I hadn't done that round where I ended up with this turning ridge of purl stitches. So I didn't want to rip out the entire hat. Uh, I just needed to re-knit uh, the ribbed part. So uh, I'm going to go to the overhead and I'm going to show you how I, I captured the base of the stockinette stitches took out the ribbing and then re-knit it going in the opposite direction. So I, I re-knit it so all of the holes were centered. I had the, the ridge of purl stitches that made picking up the ear flaps easier. And um, then I just was able to knit the ear flap uh, longer, a few rounds, a few rows longer in order to get the correct full length. Um, and then I was able um, to fix all the errors and. I'm, I'm, I don't plan on wearing this hat, um, but I did get out of it what I wanted, which was to learn some new things and to kind of remind myself of this technique of adding length to the ribbing of a hat in order um, to make it warmer. Uh, the thing that I thought was really interesting about this is that the crown decreases for this hat occur over almost the entire length of the stockinette. They aren't started just in the top third of the hat, which is what we tend to do today. At the time I was first knitting this hat, I was creating a series of technique videos on um, hat crown decreases. 
And I, I chose not to include that process um, in those videos in order just not to confuse things. But what is really interesting is that when you do create these decreases from for the whole length of the body of the hat, it causes the hat to fit more closely. So if you are creating the crown in the top third of the hat, you will get a little bit of gathering at the top. A lot of people don't like the, the gathering. So the shorter the hat crown, the more gathering you'll get. And the corollary is the longer the hat crown, the smoother the, the fit will be. And I just thought by looking at this, oh, well, this is a pointy uh, hat. That's not going to fit right. Um, but it does, it does end up fitting right. In fact, I'll just try this on for you so that you can see that it does fit my head pretty well. It's a goofy hat. I'm not gonna go out in public wearing this, but it does work well. Now, the original yarn, as I said, was raccoon and silk, and I, and I suspect it was a, a woolen preparation. Uh, because the raccoon fur wouldn't have been very easy to spin with and would, would have been a fairly short fiber. And so uh, woolen spun is, has kind of the disorganized fibers. And so I suspect that that's how the hat was knit. The yarn that I uh, was able to get at my shop that was the right weight, this is a sport weight, I think I used Cascade 220 Sport and it's a super wash wool. I don't usually like knitting with super wash because it's kind of floppy. And that is certainly the case with this hat. It has no sort of internal body to it. A regular non-super wash wool would have been better, but I think a woolen spun would have been even better in this case. And, and certainly even warmer than a worsted spun of any kind. I met my goal, I learned a lot. And I'm gonna just go to the overhead and show you a couple of things that I did when I needed to um, fix my mistakes. If you look at how the brim is seated on in the round and then how that buttonhole is seated, you can see why there's a problem that's not centered. So this brim is coming through an opening. So the openings need to be centered with each other. So the instructions had this, this hole right here centered exactly in the middle of the round. I didn't check the pattern and look at the numbers and verify that this opening right here that's halfway up the ribbing, I didn't verify that the numbers were correct um, for this opening. And so then they ended up being uh, not centered with each other. Uh, the majority of the hat is, like, in terms of percentage, it is this ribbed part, but I didn't want to have to re-knit the part that was correct. One of the problems was an error in the pattern a second problem was with me not paying attention in the pattern. At this folding point where the opening is made, that row was supposed to be worked completely as a knit row. So, so if, I'm, if I'm working around, this is the right side facing me and I'm working it and I work that as a knit row and then I work the bind off, then when this is flipped back, there would have been a fold line of purl stitches. And at first, I, I didn't really care about that. It didn't seem like it mattered until I was trying to put in the ear flaps. And the ear flaps need to get picked up along that edge. So, so having the combination of knits and purls along here made it really difficult to pick up uh, the stitches for that edge. I kept getting off, uh, going off to the wrong row, and it was really, really hard. But if I had that purl ridge there, and there would only be one purl ridge, I could keep track, I could pick up stitches easily through the heads of those purl stitches, and I could do those ear flaps. So I'm going to uh, thread a really fine circular needle through the first row of all of the stockinette stitches. I'm going to thread this through one leg of each of those uh, stitches all the way around, and then I'm going to snip the yarn in the last row of the ribbing and remove the ribbing, and then I will knit it in the opposite direction. So when I worked my first round of stockinette, I also worked a decrease. I eliminated one stitch at the beginning of the round so that the stitch count would work with the decrease situation that I set up. So I'm going to catch uh, 
the right leg of each stitch. And for this decrease, I'm just gonna come up through the center and that will catch the right leg of both of those. So I bring my needle down in between stitches and then I bring it up through the center and that's going to catch the right leg of each of these stitches. So I'm gonna do that all the way around. So I can keep track of where I am because I do have purl stitches so I can always capture the stitch above the purl stitches and just keep myself uh, in line. When you're picking up across an entire row of stockinette without something to help keep you uh, aligned, sometimes you can get off course. So I originally knit this hat with a, I think it was a US 3, which is a 3.25 millimeter needle. And the needle I'm using to pick up is thinner than that just because it's easier to get into the stitches and not remove slack. So I'm using, I think it's a double zero, which is a 1.75 millimeter. So it's quite a, quite a bit smaller. I could have used a zero, but I had a double zero, so. I figured I might as well use it. All right, so I need to think through how I'm going to, where I'm gonna make my cut. This is where I want to turn the work in this direction and then begin working the ribbing in the opposite direction. I wanna make sure that there's a, a tail at this point where I'm gonna join the yarn so that I can weave that tail in later. I don't wanna um, snip this right here and have this come out. So I'm gonna take one of these, this pearl bump right here. I'm going to snip that. And then I'm going to take a double pointed needle and pick this out to that point. So I have my tail here, and what I can do at this point is I can uh, continue around in this direction, and I can trim the tail every so often if, I, if I'm getting to the point where I'm pulling too much out each time. So I have this little bit here. So when I get to the point that I think, oh, this tail is, is getting too long to pull through each time, I can continue to, to snip it if I need to until I'm getting pretty close to uh, this starting point here, and then I'll be a little more cautious. Here we go. Okay, so, you know, I had a feeling that would happen. I didn't explain what was going on. I had pulled the tail out to about right here and I left it hanging and then I, I went back to where the tail was over here and I went all the way around. Um, because what I, what I knew was, remembered, was that when you take knitting out in the round and it's a spiral, there's going to be a point where it comes apart and you don't end up with two tails, you end up with one tail. And I wasn't really sure where that tail was going to be. I didn't think it through, I just made sure that I left room for it. So what happened was I came, came around to here and I couldn't, I was having trouble taking things out. And I think that's because of the spiral nature of knitting in the round. And so I just continued to pull this tail out in that direction until, um, until I got the whole thing. I'm going to be turning in this direction in order to work um, going back. So I'm just gonna count the loops that I actually have on my needles. I need a multiple of four and I suspect that this one may end up being a stitch. I need to uh, rip this back and I like to de-kink things, steam it before I'm going to re-knit with it. You don't have to, but I just prefer doing that. 
So the original direction of the knitting was in was this way. So each of the knit stitches looks like a V. And when you look down at the base, what has been captured on the needle now that the connecting row has been eliminated is that what's on the needle is the running thread between two stitches. So you can see this loop right here is between this column of stitches right here. But when I turn it upside down, it looks like the regular head of a stitch. It's centered in this V in this direction, which is what allows me to knit in the other direction if I'm working in stockinette or if I'm switching from stockinette to ribbing as I am here. But like I couldn't have taken out half of the ribbing, recaptured it and then knit in the other direction. Everything would have been off by a half a stitch, those columns of knits and purls. So I needed to come back to a place where the knitting looks the same in both directions, even though when I'm knitting in the other direction, I'm actually um, starting at a place that's between the two columns of original stitches. When I was first gathering up all of the stitches in the first row of stockinette, the first stitch at the beginning around was actually a knit two together. So in my original ribbing, I had 144 stitches, but I wanted 143 for the body of the hat because of, in order to get an even repeat for the decreases. So when I captured everything, um, I was talking about this tail and not knowing whether I was going to need to hold that over the needle and work that as a stitch or not. So I went and I counted everything and I had 142. So I knew that I would need this to make the 143, but I also needed to replace that stitch. I'd had a decrease that, that uh, put things together into one. And so I had to change that one stitch into two and then this also you know, needed to be worked. So at the beginning of the round, I did a lifted increase so that I brought my stitch count up to 143. And as I come to the end of the round, I'll put this over the needle and I will work it as stitch number 144. And then I will have the multiple of four that I need for the entire round. So I've just done two purls. I need to do two knits. And I need to do uh, two purls, and then I just need to work this loop that's hanging over the needle um, as a knit stitch. So I'll just uh, go through that and I'll create it as a knit stitch like this. Um, and so it will be there. And I can tie these two together, uh, that tail and the other one, tie them together for now to keep the tension on that stitch. And then I will untie them when it's time to weave in in the ends later. So I'm just do a half knot right here. And then now I can continue working in the round until I get to that fold point where I need to do the opening. So I'm really happy uh, with this hat. Again, I'm not going to wear it anywhere, but I did learn some interesting things. I got to practice a little bit of crochet here and there. I'm, I'm no crochet expert, but I do enjoy using it a little bit here and there uh, just to keep some, you know, increasing my skills uh, now and then. And I really appreciated learning about um, this hat crown technique of spreading the uh, decreases throughout the entire length of the body of the hat. Because I'm a highly experienced knitter with certification as a master hand knitter, my viewers are often surprised when I show a mistake that I've made. Either they're surprised that I make mistakes or they're surprised that I admit to making mistakes, I'm not sure. I do make mistakes all the time. It's a byproduct of being human. My technique videos are rarely just to explain the steps for executing a technique. I explain how the technique works and why, where you might run into problems or make a mistake, how you can keep track of where you are, that sort of thing. My goal with a technique video is that the person watching the video will come away with a better understanding of knitting because the more you understand knitting, the more you can control the outcome. 
I don't anticipate ever avoiding making mistakes in my knitting, and I don't imagine you will ever be able to avoid making mistakes. I have lots of technique videos on fixing different types of mistakes if that's something you're interested in. If you have any comments or questions about today's video or suggestions for videos you'd like to see in the future, you can leave those down in the comments below or you can join the discussion in my Ravelry group, Rocks Rocks. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next week.